Would you stand with me as we read God's Word? Reading from Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 37. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dinner with him. So he went and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the inside of the cup and of the dish, but inside, clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools. Did you not, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give his alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Father, we thank you for your word. It is the living, powerful, inerrant, infallible word of God that divides the sunder between soul and spirit, that helps us see ourselves as nothing else can, and that helps us see you, who we wouldn't be able to see apart from the Word. And so we pray this morning that you will reveal yourself through the Word. We ask that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher. We ask that the concepts and the thoughts will go deep into our hearts and minds, and that we will be changed as a result of this encounter with you today. Thank you for this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated and uh, please turn in your Bibles to Luke 11. Hope you have your Bibles. You never come to church without your Bible, right? You should feel naked without your Bible because you are. And uh, so bring your Bible as we come week by week. Luke chapter 11. You know, I love, one of the things I enjoy watching, listening to are gifted impressionists. Any of you enjoy them as well? Uh, Rich Little was one of my particular favorites. I don't know if he's still around or not, but I remember John Wayne was one of his staples. I, I, I look around, some of these young faces, you probably don't even know who John Wayne is, right? <laughs> Hope you know John Wayne. But John Wayne was this, you know, huge cowboy on screen, but he he had, you know, he had kind of short legs compared to the rest of his body, and so he had a really kind of a funny gait for a cowboy. And so, first time that John Wayne ever met Rich Little, he said, Rich, could you do that walk that you do? So Little was a little scared, but he took off and he did the John Wayne walk. When he got all done, Wayne looked at him and he said, well, I'm sure glad you still got it. I think I'm losing it. <laughs> it's one of the problems with Imitation, the truth is impressions are fun, right? But it doesn't take long to spot an imitation. It's shallow, it's false, it's not real. Usually it's exaggerated to make the point, and it shows. However, the same is true of spiritual impressionists. A lot of spiritual impressionists, we might call them moralists, someone looking good outwardly, but they are lacking inward reality. Outward doesn't mean anything, beloved, without reality inside. Could be called legalists, would be another word, or religionists. Paul had something to say about them when he described them this way. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, he said, they are having the appearance of godliness, but denying the power thereof. He said, avoid such people. And he might have gone on to say, and make sure that you're not one of them. So easy to fool even ourselves. See, moralists are all dressed up with nowhere to go. They look great, but they're spiritually dead. The Pharisees of Jesus' time fit this description and our churches are full of moralists as well in the 21st century. People thinking that they are saved by their good works. You say, aren't good works important? Absolutely, but only after salvation and only as a result of a, of a heart that's reaching out toward God, not as a means to get to God. So we have moralists who are 
showing off for their Christian friends at church, but if you followed around the rest of the week, they look pretty much like the rest of the world. You wouldn't be able to see much difference. And Jesus' point here is simple. You may be the best-dressed corpse in town, but at the end of the day, you're still dead. You're still a corpse. And he doesn't want you to be that way. You may be impressive outwardly, but you're cold, dead inside. Unless morality is driven by that inner love for Christ as a response to the Holy Spirit who's living within, it's meaningless. It's a shabby imitation of reality. So the background of this passage that we've just read, in verse 37, while Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee invites him to dinner. And the word that's used here suggests this is a noon meal. So Jesus is coming to lunch. He accepts a lunch invitation from a Pharisee. This didn't happen very often. For one thing, the Pharisees didn't invite typically anybody except other Pharisees to lunch. They were afraid they might be corrupted by touching something that was unclean. And so they didn't typically invite anyone else. But this Pharisee has done that. And Jesus' reaction is that he comes, but Jesus' reaction also shows that it probably wasn't specifically or even mostly for a social engagement. It was to try and trap Jesus, which the Pharisees were trying to do all the time into saying something that would put him at odds with the religious rulers or that would put him on the outs with the people. With time running short, Jesus doesn't waste any time in small talk. He bluntly tries to wake up his host here with four well-placed, well-timed jabs to the chin. The self-righteous, moralistic chin of this man and his companions, including he calls them outright fools for their misplaced piety. That causes a lawyer, lawyer not in the sense that we know them, somebody that's into civil law, but someone who knew the law of Moses and particularly knew all the traditions that the Pharisees had built up around the law. That person became a lawyer, typically a Pharisee, who was a well-educated Pharisee. So one of the lawyers jumps in in verse 45, and he says, teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And Jesus basically says, right, let me give you three more jabs to the chin to see if you get it. Jesus is not, beloved, going out of his way to be unkind here. Jesus is trying to wake these people up to the reality of their situation. So he uses these seven descriptions of how these men are dressing up their dead selves to try and make the point that that's all they're doing. They're just dressing up something that's not real. So it gives us the opportunity as we look through these to to ask ourselves, okay, so what what constitutes a well-dressed corpse? What constitutes someone who thinks they are Saved because these people thought that they really had an in with God. They're just like us. But they didn't. They were just outward. There was nothing real about them on the inside. So let's look at, over the next three weeks, we're going to look at these seven characteristics of a well-dressed corpse to ask the question, is it possible that I am one? Garment number one, for a well-dressed corpse, they are exhibitionists of externals. Verses 37 to 41, they are exhibitionists of externals. They're all about the externals. You know, trouble starts right away in in this verse. As Jesus comes to dinner, it says in verse 38, the Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. I know this sounds like mom, right? (laughs) Wash your hands before dinner. That's not the issue here. The Pharisees were big on washing, not as a matter of physical or hygienic cleansing, although when your hands need to be washed, I'm sure they and Jesus and everybody else would have said wash them. But this is about ritual washing. This is about a a process that they went through ceremonially to undo any possibility of contact they might have had with someone who was unclean, particularly a Gentile. 
or someone else that by definition in their law was unclean. The method for washing was very precise. And you had to really almost be a Pharisee to know what you could and couldn't do. For example, you had to, you had to pour the water onto one hand from the other hand and, and kind of massage it. But if you touched the other hand before you poured water on it, then everything was all unclean and you had to start all over again. So it was kind of like a surgeon scrubbing up for surgery, right? That's what they looked at and that's what they were living by. This washing was the thing that showed to them that they were doing all the right things. Now, here's a question. Was this washing ceremony prescribed by the law of God? And the answer is no. There was no such ceremonial washing prescribed in the law. This was part of the hundreds of traditions that the Pharisees had built up around the law so that they could declare themselves perfect when, in fact, they were not. They were moralists of the highest order. So here comes Jesus, and he doesn't wash his hands. Why? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons that Jesus didn't wash his hands. Number one, he wasn't going to do something that was in line with the traditions of the Pharisees, although Jesus never did anything that was against the law of God. He went out of his way often to try and, to try and violate the traditions that the Pharisees had built up around them because he was trying to make a point. And his, and his point, the point he was trying to make is this is not the way you get right with God. This is a premeditated, calculated move on the part of Jesus to provoke a reaction. He did that often to these guys as we've seen before as we move through the book of Luke. He's trying, he's trying what? He's trying to appeal to their hearts. He wants them to see that the law is about clean hearts, not about clean hands. So verse 39, he says, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You know, some of the, some of the more liberal commentators criticize Jesus here, say his manners are pretty bad. You know, he's not a very friendly guy. But beloved, we have to realize... Jesus came, think about this, Jesus came all the way from heaven to earth, went through the incarnation process, lived 30 years to be a perfect lamb of God. And he came specifically to seek and to save that which is lost, according to Luke 19, 10, right? And now the time is growing short. He's on his way, he's within the last six months, on his way to Jerusalem to give his life to provide the payment for sins. And he doesn't have a lot of time to go through small talk right? He's doing what he came to do. He came to lunch to do this. You can be sure that if his words were direct, his manner was loving. He wasn't, but he wasn't going to be tied to our 21st century ideas of what political correctness is that would, re, that would keep us from saying something that might hurt somebody's feelings when in fact they are in grave danger. Jesus wasn't tied by the same constraints that so many times tie our hands, right? He wanted to bring home the fact that these guys are in trouble, and so he illustrates. He compares their moralism to somebody that goes and washes the outside of dishes while leaving the inside clean. You know, Patty's been gone for three or four days this week, so I have to wash my own dishes. And usually they go in the dishwasher, but I, I prefer to wash. But you know, Inevitably, when she comes home, she'll take them out and say, did you wash your dishes again? You didn't put it in the dishwasher, did you? I say, why? She finds stuff. She finds stuff. Always finds the stuff. Now, I don't willingly go through and wash just the outside and miss the inside, right? I just, I just accidentally miss it anyway. But the point is, he's, Jesus is picturing somebody who washes the outside, and they don't even pay attention to the inside. Where's all the dirt? It's on the inside. Their unattended hearts are distorted by the things that are there, their pride of position and their ceremony so that all the things that they do outwardly are meaningless. 
Because inside they are, he calls them wicked. They're wicked inside. I mean, how's that for a lunch guest? <laughs> you guys are wicked. Trying to drive home the point. You've missed the whole point of the law. You've missed the whole point of the Old Testament. You've missed the whole point of God. Other than that, you got your act together. You're wicked. You will not come to God unless you know you're wicked. By their rules, they were fine. By the eyes of God who looks on the heart, they were wicked. Because when God looked on their heart, what did he find? He found pride, he found greed, he found selfishness, he found anger, he found wrath, he found hatred, he found lasciviousness, all the things that Jesus points out in other places in the Bible, that's what he found in their hearts. Same things that are in our hearts, only they had not come to a point of repenting and confessing their sins. And so their hearts remained wicked. They're like the little boy who came running in, you know, to mom. He said, mommy, mommy, I'm nine feet tall. Mom says, you're nine feet tall? How'd you, how, how, do you, how do you know you're nine feet tall? He said, I just measured myself. She said, what'd you use? He said, I just made a ruler and I measured myself. I'm nine feet tall. That's what the Pharisees were doing. They're coming in and they're saying, we're morally nine feet tall. We measured by the ruler we made. And Jesus is saying, you may be nine feet tall by you. You're zero feet tall by God. Beloved, could that be us? Because moralists just are exhibitors of the externals. They don't worry about the inside. These men were totally focused on what one does. Jesus was focused on what one is. The word translated greed there in verse 40 is a word which means to plunder or to pillage. In, the, in, in, the, in classical Greek, it meant to rape. It's a very descriptive word. Jesus is saying, that's what I'm seeing in your heart. You, you, you don't understand, but what's in your heart, you are you are not only raping and pillaging others, you are doing the same to yourself. You're full of greed. You're full of plunder. It rapes people because it focuses them on the outward appearance. God has always been about the heart. The Pharisees should have known this. It's all over the place. He says in verse 40, he says, you fools, did you not know that he who made the outside made the inside also? Somehow they thought what was inside would be hidden if they got the outside right. What a, what a mistake that is, right? He's saying, listen, the same God who made the outside, if you made the inside, he knows your heart. So is the outside important? Absolutely. But only as it reflects a heart of faith and of love for God. These guys had a they had a huge disconnect between who they were outwardly and who they were inwardly. Moses challenges Israel to return to God in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 2. Let's, let's turn there. Deuteronomy 6. In verse 2, Moses challenges them to turn to God. That you may fear the Lord your God. This fear of the Lord is just the heart of the Scripture. The more you... Read the scripture, the more you see it's everywhere. This is to be the heart of our existence, the fear of the Lord, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good sense. Your sons and daughters, you're, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, turn to God, he's telling them. But then he says in verse 6, drop down there, and he says, these words I command you today, shall be on your what? Heart. Moses wasn't encouraging the people just to be outward. He was encouraging them that they need to be inward. He says elsewhere, and the, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Jeremiah 4, verse 4, challenges the people, circumcise yourself to the Lord. Physically, no. He goes on and he says, remove the foreskin of your hearts. 1 Samuel 8, verse 7, you remember when Samuel went down to anoint a king in Jesse's house and he kept going through son after son. Thought this one looked good. God said, Samuel, you're looking at the outside. 
God doesn't look at the outside. He said, God is not a man who looks on the outside. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. This will help you, by the way, interpret so much scripture if you just remember God looks on the heart. He's always looking at the heart. He speaks to the heart. The words that he says are intended to speak to the heart. It's what's inside that counts. Moralism just looks at the outside. Moralism is right actions separated from right motives. Jesus' point in verse 41, he says, but give as alms those things that are within and then behold, everything is clean for you. He's saying what you do outwardly must reflect who you are inwardly. The Pharisees lived in a fantasy land that suggested you can, do, you can do one thing and you can be another. Jesus says, no way. You're just a well-dressed dead man. That's all you are. Some of you may remember the, uh, the film, The Big Chill, if you're old enough, you might remember that, The Big Chill. Don't particularly recommend it, but um, saw that film one time, and it starts, it's, a, it's about a college reunion between a bunch of friends who were in college together. And, and in the opening of that film, to the tune of, uh, I heard it through the grapevine, there's a woman's hands getting a guy all dressed up, right? And she, every hair is in place, the right tie is on, new suit, new shirt, everything is great, but he's a corpse. The reason for the reunion is one of the friends has died. And so they're all coming together and every hair is in place, everything is perfect, but he never got to the party. Dead. That's what it's like when we're dressing up the outside. It's what the Pharisees were like, religious to a fault, never missing church, giving to the building fund, doing all the right things, right? But for the wrong reasons, and it didn't count. Those things that are done only for outward appearance are useless. They're just dressing up a dead corpse. That's the way we have the appearance of godliness, but deny its power. Moralism without the heart is dead. Now, beloved, this is, you know, in the case of the Pharisees, is primarily addressed to unbelievers, right? These, these guys weren't even in the camp. But we shouldn't leave this without applying this to ourselves as believers as well because we can fall into the same trap. We can be coming to church, can be being on the praise team, reading the Bible, going going through all these motions, but that's all it is. It's just going through the motions. In fact, we're, we, we come to the place we hate it. You know, we're, we're bored by it. You know, if we're bored by the holiness of God, beloved, we're, something's wrong with our heart. I know it's hard. I know the disciplines are hard, but, we, but when we lose touch with the Lord, see, then suddenly the things we're doing are just outward. They're not inward, and we're not a... We're not a corpse. We're not dressing up a corpse, but we're, dressed, we're just a well-dressed fake. We're living a wasted life because God can't use that in us any more than he can in the unbeliever. We're people who, I'll tell you what we are, we're people who have lost, not lost, we're people who have left our first love. We're, we're like the boy, you know, who mom keeps telling me, you know, sit down and be quiet because he's acting up. Sit down and be quiet. So she finally grabs him by the head and says, sit down and be quiet. And he finally realized he got to do this. So he sits down and then he says, he's going to have the last word he says to his mom. He said, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> Some of you guys have kids like that. Some of you were kids like that. Some of you still are kids like that, right? Rebellious to the core. We can be that way with God because we've left our first love. Jesus says this in Revelation 2 to the church at Ephesus. This was a great church. This was a, Paul spent a lot of time in that church. He said, I know you guys can spot, you can spot, a, you can spot false doctrine from a mile away. You, don't, you will not allow false teachers. I commend you for all of those things. But he said, I've got something against you, Revelation 2, 4, that you have abandoned 
the love you had at first. You, you've gotten distracted by all the things of the world over here. And you've abandoned the love. You didn't, you didn't lose it. You abandoned it. You took up something else. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent. What's the answer? Repent. Acknowledge who you are and what you've become. And get back to the work she did at the beginning out of a heart of love for God. Exhibit, exib, exhibitionists of externals. One way you can tell you're into moralism. How's this? Here's the second one. Second one. Trivializers of truth. That's the second outfit of moralists. They are trivializers of truth. They major on the minors. They wear trivialities proudly. This is verse 42. Jesus says back in, I guess we ought to get back in Luke 11, verse 42. Jesus says, but woe to you Pharisees. Woe, woe by the way, is a, is a strong word. It means curse. Jesus gives a lot of woes to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, just before he's going to the cross, basically. And, 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 I, and, and I, I hear pastors, you know, just rail on those in the harshest terms. I don't think Jesus used the word woe in harsh terms, beloved. I think what he's saying is, I think, I think he's, always, he's always about calling them to repentance, but he's reminding them that they are under a cursed state if they don't come to repentance. So I think the word woe needs to be expressed with, as a warning, but spoken with regret that this is necessary. Woe to you, Pharisees. And then, and then he picks on the point of their greatest pride. They, they were nothing if not tithers. Now, I realize that's not a point of pride to most people today. If they're going to be proud about some, it isn't going to be tithing. But with the Pharisees, it was. This was, this was. this was what separated them most from the hoi polloi. I mean, that's just the way they looked at things. So he says in verse 42, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe the mint and the rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Now, did God's law prescribe a 10% tithe for the major crops of the field? Yes, absolutely. Did it prescribe a 10% tithe for the garden variety vegetables and herbs and spices? No. But you see, the, the Pharisees had gone beyond here. They said, hey, we don't just... We don't just tithe the cross, man. We tithe everything, including the stuff that comes out of the garden. You're not going to catch us not tithing. We tithe everything. They were going above and beyond. So is that a problem? No. In itself, no. So I always got a kick out of people that say tithing isn't in the New Testament. They didn't read this. Jesus said, don't tithe. He said, you ought to have done that. So what's the problem? It's a hard problem. It's all for show, right? It's all for show. They gave ostentatiously to be praised by men, but the state of their heart was shown by what they neglected. They neglected compassion. They neglected the love of God. You know, if you want to summarize the law in two points, which Jesus did by saying that what was the law summarized up in this, that you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. That wasn't even in their vocabulary. But tithe, <laughs> they had that down. All outward. They neglected the justice and the love of God, and those were all through the Old Testament as well. Deuteronomy 6.5, God said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Micah 6.8, he has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. See, these are the major things that are not even on their radar. But boy, they're down on the minor things. They got that down. You know, the very way they paid their tithes showed this to be true. Jesus talks about it elsewhere in Matthew 6, verse 2. He describes what they did. He said, thus when you give to the needy, 
Sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. You know, there's no record, there's, there's no historical record that, that I can find or that the commentators can find that shows that anybody, any of these guys actually you know, had trumpets be, go before them and play as they, were, as they were paying their tithes but they found subtle ways to trumpet the fact that they were doing this. That's what Jesus is getting at. They commonly would go to the most busy corners in the street, cross streets, to give to the poor so that the most people could see them. So if you're a beggar, you knew where to go. They wanted people to see them. They wanted people to see what great people they were. They tithed meticulously to be honored by men and to buy God off. You can tell whether your giving is coming from the heart or not by are you doing this because you love God or are you doing this to buy God off? Are you looking for a way to get something from God? Are you, looking, are you thinking you're going to put God under obligation? That's what they were doing. Jesus knew that. He says in Mark 7, verse 9, he says, he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. How do they do that? How do they reject the command of God? Here's how they do that. Verse 10 of Mark 7. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. That's pretty much in God's law, right? And whoever reviles his mother and father must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father and his mother, this was in their traditions, if you, you say, if a man tells his father and mother, whatever you might have gained from me is Corban that is given to God then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you handed down and many such things you do. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying, I I know you guys. I know what you do. So you can look better with men and buy God off more. You get more, as much money as you can. And one of the ways you do it is you go over here to say, mom and dad who are in need of help, sorry, I I gave it to God. So by your very traditions, which say this is okay to do, you are rejecting the commandment of God. Wow. These guys are stealing from their own parents in order to look good outwardly. They are majoring on the trivial. And in one fell swoop, they are majoring on the trivial, the tithes, and they are missing the majors, which is to love God, to do justice, to act in kindness, to honor your father and mother. They totally failed. They failed for the sake of their own traditions. Why? Because you get double points for tithing. What a mess. They gave from a rebellious heart, but they didn't realize all they were doing was dressing up a dead man. So what can we say to that by way of application? Well, first to those who have never truly come to faith in Christ, never really made that commitment to him, many think that they have because of the good things that they do. And you think their church attendance or their giving to the United Way, working for a charity, mostly it usually involves giving a little bit of money here or there somewhere. You could walk out of here and give money to the Gideons today and think you're buying God off. Don't do that. God doesn't need your money, beloved. It's your privilege to give. If you're buying God off, you can't buy God off. None of these things are bad, but unless they're motivated by a heart of love for God, they're useless. They're meaningless. They're absolutely fruitless. They're worse than that because they give us a sense of entitlement. They give us a sense that God is now indebted to us. We're like the little boy, you know, who, whose friend got a new bicycle. He went to his mom and he said, Mom, can I, have a, can I have a new bicycle? Billy got a new bicycle. Can I have a new bicycle? Mom thought this is a good teaching moment. So she said to her son, she said, well, why don't you ask Jesus for a new bike? So the boy went to his room and he started to write a letter, you know, said, dear Jesus, I have been really good. 
Can I please have a new bicycle? Love, Leroy. And then he got thinking about it and he thought, that might be a little strong. So he tore the letter up and he started over. He said, dear Jesus, I have really tried to be good. Could I please have a new bicycle? Love, Leroy. A couple minutes he realized that probably wouldn't play either. So he wrote a, tried a third time. He said, dear Jesus, I have always meant to be good. Could I please have a new bicycle? Love, Leroy. But it didn't take him long to realize, yeah, that didn't play either. So he took a walk down the street to, to, to a nearby church. He thought, I'll meditate in here for a while. I'll try and figure out how I can ask Jesus for this bicycle. And as he was sitting there thinking about this, he noticed the statue over in the corner. He grabbed the statue. He ran home. And he tried a fourth letter. He said, hey, Jesus, I got your mama. If you want her back, I need a bicycle. That's what we're like, beloved, when we think we can buy God off with some little deed here or some little giving there or some little thing we've done here. You can't put God in your debt. You can't hostage your way to God. How foolish. Beloved, all we can do with regard to God is accept his free gift of eternal life, right? That's, there isn't any other way. All of our goodness could never get us there. But what about believers? Can we be purveyors of triviality as well, majoring in minors? Oh, can we, <laughs> right? Now, I'm, the examples here, you know, so I don't give offense, nobody in this church would ever do these things. Here's what some people do. You know, they criticize the music, but they never think about praying for the missionaries, right? You could ask them today, who are the missionaries in your church? They wouldn't be able to tell you. That's, that's not true of our church, you realize. That's just other places. Or we object to the noisy, you know, we object to the, to the noisy, messy kids who kind of get the carpet dirty. You know, I'm thankful in our church, I really think we were without kids long enough that we love our kids now. I think that's true. But, you know, we do that. We complain about the mess they make, but we have no desire or interest to be involved in or pray for the Good News Club that our church runs at the school every spring and every fall. Do you even know we do that? Do you even know? We criticize the leaders, but do you pray for them? Beloved, we're as guilty as the next. We're trustees of trivialities. We're about externals. We're just playing church oftentimes, giving a good imitation of what we think it means to be spiritual. Now let me say this in all sincerity. I sat down early this week and just started going through the different ministries or different things that are going on in our church because God has specifically called somebody and given them a vision and a burden for something. I was, abs I was blown away. Th these are not programs that we started as a church. These are just places where God called this person to this ministry, this person to this ministry, this person to this ministry, this person to this thing. It's, it's all over our church. I take it as a sign that the Holy Spirit is at work because this is not something that we're building up. And I'm so grateful for that. I, I, as, your, as your pastor, it gives me tremendous encouragement to think that God is working among us. And he is. But it doesn't take very long, beloved, that we could get, we could get waylaid too. We get distracted. We could get, get back where we're just paying attention to the things that are trivial, externals, become the name of the game. Don't let it do that. My Uncle Gene, 80, 85 now, he's living in Kansas. Some of you have met him. He's been here a time or two. He was a missionary in West Africa with, beginning in 1952 for 35 years. It was with an organization called WEC, W-E-C, Worldwide Evangelistic Crusade. It was founded by a man named C.T. Studd, 
Stud came up from a very wealthy English family. In the, in the uh, late 1800s, he was, he was well known around the world as, as probably the greatest cricket player in the world, <laughs> whatever kind of honor that is. But, you know, they, some people who were into that thought it was great. Best cricket player of his time. But he went to a meeting that D.L. Moody was holding one time in England, and he came to faith in Christ. I want to tell you, his life changed. There was nothing halfway or trivial about his commitment to Christ. Most of his money went into the mission that he founded. Eventually, he shared the Lord as a a missionary himself on three continents, including Africa. He could have lived a life of ease. He He could have lived in comfort chose to follow Christ, and he said this, what is all the fame and flattery worth when a man comes face to face with eternity? He's been in eternity now since 1931. What is that, 70, almost, almost a little, little, little over 80 years. Think he regrets his decision? I don't think so. He said this one time. He said, some want to live within the sound of a church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. I like that. That should be the mentality of all of us, whether we're actually going or whether we're just sending and supporting and doing whatever we can where we are. Not majoring on the minors, not getting involved in the trivialities, not just about externals, but letting God capture our heart, take us to the hard places even in our own life, witnessing to people who make fun of us, mock us, ask questions we can't answer, so we, you know, what do you do? Persist. For the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the challenge. We don't want to mimic the real thing. We want to be the real thing. We confess, we confess. We do a lot of mimicking. At our best, we put on a show. Father, we repent. We pray that you'll forgive us. We ask you for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, who paid the price for all of our sins to forgive us. And then we ask you, as you have created a new creation within us, to take that new heart, cause it to pump fully and completely Again, help us to return to the love that we've left and return to the works that we did so willingly, perhaps in the beginning, that you're calling us back to. Lord, help it to be true. For your sake as well as for ours, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.